Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you. And I noticed when you were writing in that I am not the only one joining you from Israel. It's so lovely that we have a handful of folks uh, really logging on from all around the world, including from Jerusalem. So it is uh, nighttime here um, in Israel. And I'm really uh, selfishly, I'm excited to have this opportunity to dive into Megillat Esther uh, with you. So I saw someone, um, you can definitely catch up on the recordings from the first two sessions. This is a series on the five Megillot and, uh, and the book of Jonah, which um, during that class, I, I, I must have said a few sentences justifying why I think we should throw it into the mix. It's also associated with the holiday. It also is a, is a wonderful uh, uh, genre of literature that when we study it, it's a great way for us to get a broad sense of Tanakh. Um, but I think, Julie, that our idea for this series happened right around Purim. Or if not, I knew that when we landed on this series that um, I was most excited about, about this session, about Megillat Esther. I love Megillat Esther any year, but all the more so this year. Be for, and I, I'll tell you why. Two, two reasons. First, the article link that Julie just shared, we're, we're not going to make use of the article uh, tonight, I just recommend that, um, I hope that the class inspires you to go back and read it. First of all, it's um, an article hosted on My Jewish Learning, um, and it's written by the scholar Adele Berlin, who um, she herself wrote the JPS commentary volume on Megillah Tester, and she is um, a really important uh, thinker in the world of Bible study, academic Bible study um, in general. And she lays out for us beautifully in this article the fact that uh, when we look at Miguel Esther from a literary perspective, we, um, will, we, we will miss the point entirely if we don't begin by seeing that this is a comedy. Like Greek comedy, this is a comedy. Its genre is farce. And once we see that, only then can the work come alive for us. Only then can we like, you know, get the joke, so to speak. And like all commentary, like all uh, great satire, so if you do choose to read this article, she'll touch on, there are some scholars who call it satire, she sort of shies away from that. But, but, um, but if we borrow the word satire, like all great satire, satire uh, is, a, is a genre we need to make use of when the world has gotten so ridiculous that we almost can't say it straight. That there's something about the complexities of the themes that to say it straight is to oversimplify and that it's only through satire where we're saying or where we're, where we're projecting something up and amplifying and almost presenting caricatures of, of uh, persona, which we're gonna see when we dive into the Megillah. It's only by allowing things to be ridiculous and laughing at them and then turning them on its head, which is the essence of this class, turning it on its head, only then can the can the truth really get clear for us. Um, so the um, when we study Torah in general, not the Megillah, not a work of farce. When we study Torah, Perkei Avot says about Torah, turn it and turn it because everything is in it. This idea that that the complexity of Torah is best understood when we let it function like a prison or like a thousand faceted diamond. And it's only by engaging it in its complexity that we can come to know the thing. So the Megillah takes this idea of turning it and it says that on the deepest level, Purim is the holiday of Nafohu. This idea of la pech, Nafohu, turning it over, is the key that's going to unlock the Megillah for us. And so the, um, the, the way that satire turns things on its head in order to open up vast expanses of meaning, that, that's what the Torah, that's what the Megillah does for us. So that's the first reason I love it. The second reason I love it is that 
Um, as I'm sure you know, if you've heard anything about Megillat Esther, you've likely heard that it's the only book in the Tanakh where God is not explicitly mentioned. What I love about all of the Megillot, and I'll do a quick plug for our next, our next session when we get together in a month, we're going to study Shir, uh, Shira Shirin, Song of Songs, and equally, for vastly different reasons, actually, most of the books I get to do with you. Also, we asked this question about Kohelet uh, in Sukkot. Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, Megillat Esther, Sher Shirim, these are three books that when we look at them, we know that there was something like a you know, constitutional convention of sorts, that there was a moment in Jewish history where a group of decision makers got together and decided what would be included in the canon and what would be excluded. And they had a set of criteria um, and the criteria are largely what you would expect, that if you want to preserve a faith tradition for the long haul, you're probably going to want to preserve literature that's going to be a collection of sacred narrative, that's going to answer core questions, that's going to sort of toe the line, so to speak. And we know that that's why the decision makers who closed the canon, we know that they were motivated by this question of how can we preserve the Jewish people, likely how can we preserve the Jewish people when they went into exile. So anyway, there were a set of criteria for what to go, what should go in the canon. And when we look at these three Megillot that I just mentioned, each for their own reason, we're sort of shocked that they would have been included in the canon. And so Megillot to stare, it's shocking because God is not explicitly mentioned. However, I think, I don't know, I have a lot of favorites, but I think maybe my number one favorite thing about the Megillah is that we know that the Megillah is describing for us a world, what we call, um, theologically speaking, we call this hester panim, that this is a world in which God's face is hidden. And so that what, the, what our scholars say is that it's not that God is absent, from this story of near destruction and then averting disaster, but rather that God's face is hidden. So I'm gonna go ahead now and share my screen because I want to um, show you this verse on the inside. And also if you were with me two weeks ago, um, when I didn't have the verse for you, I wanted to make right on it and, and make be sure that we had the verse. So Julie's gonna put the, um, the link in the chat if you wanna actually load the, load the source sheet. I like the, the Safari print interface better, so I have it here for us as a PDF. Um, so this idea of hester panim, that God's face is hidden, and it's not that God is absent, it's just that God is hidden away. Um, that idea is actually hinted at in the Chumash, in the Torah itself. As it turns out, you know, the name Esther, this is another fascinating topic to research, um, there are those who would say that both uh, Esther and Mordechai's names are, are indicators of the level, the degree of their assimilation, that these are not Hebrew words, and that these even can be associated with, with the names of Babylonian gods. Um, and yet, the Torah itself actually has the word Esther in it, but not as a name, as a promise. It says in the book of Devarim in Deuteronomy, it's describing, Deuteronomy has a, a hefty collection of blessings and curses that's forward looking in ways that other parts of the Torah are not. And it says, know that there will one day come a time when I, God, will take up this posture that is hester panim, that is having my, haste, my face hidden from you. And so when we look at that verse, we have it here on the, the share, V'nochi hester estir panai bayom hahu. So the translation of that is, I, God, will surely guard, uh, surely uh, uh, conceal my face, my countenance on that day because of all the evil that the people have done turning away to other gods. But when we look at the word itself, we can see that this phrase, estir, we have here this hint of, of the name Esther herself. And so what we're gonna find as we go through the Megillah, and, and this has been a framing from now, we're really gonna try to let, let the Megillah speak for itself. And we're gonna try to get at a number of these themes from within the text itself. What we're gonna find is that, um, that this, that this I, when we allow the book to, uh, to be nonsensical, 
when we take this modus operandi of turning it on its head, we're actually going to find a profound spirituality that is hinted at in the Torah itself. Um, we're going to find a God that's hidden and maybe, um, maybe a God that's more relatable or more resonant to the world that we live in, maybe a theology that might, that might speak to our own more so than, you know, um, for example, the God who's going to bring plagues and split the sea in the, in the stories of Pesach that we'll be marking in a month. Um, and, uh, and maybe a God who is uh, empowering the people differently by being hidden as opposed to being um, above or, or um, doing, doing for. When we have a really uh, profound, weighty presence of divinity, when God is the savior, we're not the savior. In this case, in Megillat Esther, God is not the savior. And so we can't help but save ourselves. Okay, so we are going to explore Megillat Esther through the lens of farce. We're going, we have to know that, um, that, that uh, we, we want to get the joke. When things seem ridiculous, they seem ridiculous because they are ridiculous. And nowhere is that truer then in the first chapter. So I'm gonna start reading for us. Uh, and I should have said, we're gonna pause after each chapter section. Um, and I wanna, I wanna pause, I'll stop the share. And I would really love to hear your insights, your comments, any questions that you might have. So um, you can even be writing those in as we're going and reading. Uh, and then we'll pause and we'll, we'll do a little bit of catch up and I will read out some of your comments so that we can get your voices into the mix as well. Okay, so it was hard for me to excerpt. And of course, I would have loved for us to just read all 10 chapters together, but we would never have had time for that. Um, and so I want us to see the comical aspects of the Megillah here in this excerpt from the first chapter. I'm going to read for us. So we find ourselves in the palace of King Ahasuerus at a party, okay? For no fewer than 180 days, he displayed the vast riches of his kingdom and the splendid glory of his majesty. At the end of this period, the king gave a banquet for seven days in the court of the king's palace garden for all of the people who lived in the fortress Shushan, high and low alike. There were hangings of white cotton and blue wool caught up by cords of fine linen and purple wool to silver rods and alabaster columns. And there were couches of gold and silver on a pavement of marble, alabaster, mother of pearl and mosaics. Royal wine was served in abundance as befits a king in gold and beakers, beakers of varied designs. And the rule for the drinking was no restrictions for the king had given orders to every palace steward to comply with each man's wishes. So I would really love to hear from you in the chat. What, what are some of the pieces that jump out at you from that section? I wanna know, thinking about what you know of Judaism, the texts that you've studied, whether it's from the Torah or elsewhere, the language that we had here and the themes that we just had in this opening section of the first chapter, what does it remind you of? Where, where else do we see language like this with all of these colors and, and fabrics and the characters that we just met? What does this remind you of? Great, thank you. So, so Ellen says, we get these kind, this kind of imagery in the Mishkan. So we have, two, we have two things going on here. First of all, we're in the palace of a king, and we know that in Judaism, for the most part, king is code for God, right? And that's something that we're gonna hit up against in the Megillah again and again, that this is the story of a king, but it's not the king we're used to. And in many ways, Ahasuerus is really sort of a, a nightmare if I were to associate his characteristics with you know, the ruler of the universe. So we're in the palace of a king, but it's not the king we're used to. And yet we are, we're getting, the, we're, on one hand, we're getting all this imagery that just reads a lot like the Mishkan, even uh, similar colors, similar actual fabrics. And so we find ourselves sort of in a familiar environment, and yet it's really quite unfamiliar. That's on one hand. On the other hand, did you notice this is, there are rules in this palace. What are the rules? The rule of the party was 
I know I stopped the share, so you have to have a you have to have it open to to know. This, so um, Reb Zev Chaim is saying the sheer extravagance of the language evokes Shlomo Amelech, as so often the Tanakh is radically anti-monarchical. Okay, great. So definitely we have um, uh, that that the the temple as built by Shlomo that he has a lot of this a lot of this extravagance. So Donna says more wine. It's yes, it's good. Thank you. Stisia, is that I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Stisia. So yes, it's it's not just more wine. The rule of the party is no restrictions. So now we should know this is this is unusual for Judaism, right? This is unusual for Judaism. And even more than that, here we are one month before Pesach, and if you had a chance, if you were with us uh, two weeks ago when we were doing some of the spiritual uh, dimensions of the month of Adar, we looked at, the, we juxtaposed uh, the themes of Adar and Purim with the themes of Pesach. So one month from now, we are going to be so steeped in rules. We are going to have rules coming out of our ears. We are going to take ourselves so seriously and it's through those rules that we celebrate our freedom. We say, look, we're free. We are no longer slaves. We have so many rules, right? That's how we do it as Jews. And honestly, like if we could open the open our mics right now and really share, some of us would probably share that we love that, right? We love we love the details. We love the covering our counters with with tin foil. Like we just we 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 love the the OCD nature in us. Just like really embraces that. And yet here we are in a palace of the king, where the rule of the party is no rules. And so this has to let us know that we you know we are not in Oz anymore, so to speak. Okay. Um, good. So we're about to get to Vashti. Women have a separate party by Vashti. Um, oh, I lost you all. There we go. Okay. Before I restart the share, any questions before we go forward? Okay, we'll pause again for questions in a moment. I'm going to restart the share because I want to go a little bit further within chapter one. Um, and okay, so so absolutely right. There is a parallel party, and I skipped a little bit here. Um, there is a parallel party going on for women, and we're going to see two more uh, farcical elements here in the end of chapter one that are also going to be very important foreshadowings for us of the themes that are gonna be um, raised in the rest of the Megillah. So uh, there's a separate party going on for women, and uh, but King Ahasuerus has demanded that Ra Vashti come and show off her beauty, come in her crown to his party, and she has refused. So what he asked shall be done according to the law to Queen Vashti for failing to obey the king's the command of King Ahasuerus conveyed by the eunuchs. Thereupon, Menuchan declared in the presence of the king and the ministers, Queen Vashti has committed an offense, not only as your majesty, but also against all the officials and against all the peoples in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will make all wives despise their husbands as they reflect the King Ahasuerus himself ordered Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the ladies of Persia and Medea, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will cite it to all your majesty's officials, and there will be no end of scorn and provocation. If it please your majesty, let a royal edict be issued by you, and that it be written into the laws of Persia and Medea, so that it cannot be abrogated that Vashti shall never enter the presence of King Ahasuerus, and let your majesty bestow her royal state upon another who is more worthy than she. Then will the judgment be executed by your majesty, resound throughout your realm, vast though it is, and all wives will treat their husbands with respect, high and low alike. The proposal was approved by the king and the ministers, and the king did as Mukhu Khan proposed. Dispatches were sent to all of the provinces of the king, to every province in his own script, and to every nation in its own language, that every man should wield authority in his home and speak the language of his own people. All right. So first of all, if you have questions jumping out at you, I want you to put them in the chat. Some very important elements in this, um, in this section that we just read. First of all, we really see the caricature aspects, the farcical aspects of the Megillah here because of all of this extreme language. Because of this one incident, 
all the women in these 127 provinces are going to start to behave a certain way and it's going to cause mass havoc right so so this exaggeration is part is a reflection of the genre that's the first piece the second piece is that this this business about writing edicts it's going to come back for us again it's how the migila ends and it takes us again inside of some of the some of the we should be sort of scratching our head we know we're in a palace we're with a king who's not so familiar to us and now we're writing official text and what we find is that really the way that the way that things are made official in this kingdom is that they get written into royal edicts and sent out. So that also should begin to, that's, that's, that's an interesting thing. Because if we were to have a conversation, if we were to do a separate class about what happened at Har Sinai, at the giving of the Torah, and how that compares with what the Torah is as a written text, and if we were to get into the nitty gritty of, but when exactly was it written down? And what exactly did God speak versus what did Moshe write? And when versus, you know, maybe, maybe we would head to academic approaches that it was, you know, written by other authors and much later, right? The bottom, the point is that Judaism, we call ourselves the people of the book. And this, in this work of comedy, the, the, the Megillah is beginning to play with the writing of text. And what we're going to find, if this, we're not going to have, we're not going to be able to do this part together tonight, but if we were to stay with the Hashverosh uh, as a character, we would find that, you know, he's constantly um, losing his authority. He's passing his ring off here and there. It's not really clear who's in charge, but it's probably not him. You know, Haman's going to vie for it. His, uh, his advisors, uh, eventually Mordechai is going to rise to a certain to a certain role, um, the authority in the book is held through the writing of edicts. The last piece that we get foreshadowed uh, in, in this first chapter is this dimension of, of feminism. Well, uh, two, two last pieces. The first, this feminist dimension, right? Vashti becomes a, a, a feminist icon. Now there's, there's, there's since the Me Too movement, uh, you know, folks say Vashti is the first, uh, the, first, uh, the first champion of the Me Too movement. Um, but the, you know, women, women in the Megillah is not our topic tonight, but there's, there's a really fat, women play a really, really fascinating role in the Megillah. We have Vashti here in her rebellion and the profound impact that uh, King Ahasuerus' advisors fear she's going to have. We have the, the consequence that they want, the decree that all men will rule over their wives, right? And then we have um, uh, um, that, uh, sorry, okay, I'm back with you. Um, that, uh, so, so we have Vashti sort of as a, as a feminist icon, and then we have this, you know, this clamping down on her. And then of course, the heart of the Megillah is going to be in the figure of Queen Esther, who's going to find her power over the course of the Megillah. And I hope we'll get to see some of that on the inside. And then we have the, and then I, I brought you, I don't know if we're gonna get to it, but I brought you the, we have this really curious character of Zeresh, um, Haman's, Haman's wife. So all in all, there's stuff going on with women and we're getting that foreshadowed here. The last little detail that we read, of course, in the end of this edict, we have this addition and all people shall speak. What's the exact phrasing? Uh, all people uh, shall speak everywhere and everyone in his home should speak the language of his own people. So that is another very interesting foreshadowing of some of the, the ethnic uh, themes that are going to arise because this eventually becomes a book about about ethnic cleansing of the Jewish people. Okay, so I would like to turn and I'm going to read out some of the questions and some of the comments. Um, okay, so I can see that we have a sub discussion going on, which is great. Um, so good. So I so Sharon is asking. I thought Vashti was executed. Is that not so? It appears that she was only banished. So the Megillah is unclear about it, but certainly. Um, uh, there's a, 
Yeah, right. So, so there, there's a discussion that you thought she was executed is because some sources say that she was executed, uh, but um, but we don't get that detail in the in the Migila itself. Um, okay. So I'll just hold one sec. Any questions about any of these themes that are laid out for us in the first chapter? All right, so let's get into the meat of our story. Okay, so I brought us a long section here from chapter two because this is really where we get the, um, this is the aspects of story that we're gonna get into. And then from here, we're going to to, to uh, go with the media as it pulls out some themes. Um, so we're not going to, I don't think we're gonna have time today to, we're not gonna do the war that comes at the end of this book. And we're not gonna do the um, Mordechai and Esther really rising to power and taking up power that comes at the end of the book. Um, so that you'll have to do on your own or on forum itself. Um, but, but we're gonna do uh, these narrative elements that come in the first two thirds of the Megillah. So let's, let's get a little bit more of the story. Sometime afterwards, when the anger of King Ahasuerus subsided, he thought of Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. The king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought out for your majesty. Let your majesty appoint officers in every province of your realm to assemble all the beautiful young virgin, virgins at the fortress Shushan in the harem under the supervision of Hege, the king's eunuch, guardian of the women. Let them be provided with their cosmetics and let the maiden who pleases your majesty be queen instead of Vashti. The proposal pleased the king and he acted upon it. In the fortress, Shushan lived a Jew by the name of Mordechai, son of Yair, son of Shim'i, son of Kish, a Benjaminite. Kish had been exiled from Jerusalem in the group that was carried into exile, along with King Yehoniah of Judah, which had been driven into exile by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. He was foster father to Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter, for she had neither father nor mother, the maiden was shapely and beautiful, and when her father and mother died, Mordechai adopted her as his own daughter. When the king's order, an edict was proclaimed, and when many girls were assembled in the fortress Shushan, under the supervision of Hegai, Esther too was taken into the king's palace under the supervision of Hegai, guardian of the women. The girl pleased him and won his favor, and when he hastened to furnish her with her cosmetics and her rations, as well as if the, with the seven maids who were her due from the king's palace, and he treated her and her maids with special kindness in the harem. Esther did not reveal her people or her kindred, for Mordechai had told her not to reveal it. Every single day, Mordechai would walk about in front of the court of the harem to learn how Esther was faring and what was happening to her. When each girl's turn came to go to King Ahasuerus, at the end of 12 months treatment prescribed for women, for that was the period spent on beaut beautifying them, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and women's cosmetics. And it was after that, that the girl would go to the king and whatever she asked for would be given to her to take with her from the harem to the king's palace. She would go in the evening and leave in the morning for the second harem in charge of Shazgaz, the king's eunuch, guardian of the concubines. She would not go again to the king unless the king wanted her, when she would be summoned by name. When the turn came for Esther, daughter of Abigail, the son of Mordechai, the uncle of Mordechai, who had adopted her as his own daughter to go to the king, she did not ask for anything, but what Haggai, the king's eunuch, guardian of the women, advised. Yet, Esther won the admiration of all who saw her. Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus in his royal palace in the 10th month with the month of Tevet in the year, seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she won his grace and favor more than all the virgins. So he set a royal diadem on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Um, okay, there's another party we're going to skip and let's meet uh, Haman. Um, okay, uh, I'm jumping to, oh, why did we not have verse numbers in this section? Okay, at that time when Mordechai, so there was another party they had going and let's now, let's see Mordechai in action. At that time when Mordechai was sitting in the palace gate, Bitan and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs who had guarded the threshold became angry and plotted to do away with King Ahasuerus. Mordechai learned of it and told it to Queen Esther and Esther reported it to the king in Mordechai's name. The matter was investigated and found to be so, and the two were impaled on stakes. 
This was recorded in the Book of Annals at the, insistent, at the instance of the king. Sometimes afterwards, sometime afterwards, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, son of Hamadatta the Agagi, and advanced him and seated him higher than any of his fellow officials. All the king's courtiers in the palace gate knelt and bowed low to Haman, for such was the king's order concerning him. But Mordechai would not kneel or bow low. Then the king's courtiers who were in the palace gate said to Mordechai, why do you disobey the king's order? When they spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to them. They told Haman in order to see whether Mordechai's resolve would prevail, for he had explained to them that he was a Jew. When Haman saw that Mordechai would not kneel or bow low to him, Haman was filled with rage, but he disdained to lay hands on Mordechai alone, having been told who Mordechai's people were. Haman plotted to do away with all the Jews, Mordechai's people, throughout the kingdom of Ahasuerus. In the first month, that is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, Pur, which means the lot, was cast before Haman, concerning every day and every month, until it fell on the twelfth month, that is the month of Adar. Haman then said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people, scattered and dispersed among the other peoples in all the provinces of your realm, whose laws are different from those of any other people, and who do not obey the king's laws. And it is not in your majesty's interest to tolerate them. If it please your majesty, let an edict be drawn for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the stewards for the deposit in the royal treasury. Thereupon the king removed his signet ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, son of Hamadatta, the Agagi, and the, the foe of the Jews. And the king said, the money and the people are yours to do with as you see fit. Okay, I would love if we could put into the chat, obviously that was a, a hefty hunk of text, and I hope that, that the story elements are a little bit familiar to you. Um, I would love if we could put into the chat what are, we can just sort of list out, if we were, if we were unmuted, we would be popcorning our thoughts. What are some of the, the theme, what are the, some of the elements of the story that, um, that, that we got in that snapshot? What is this story about? Because here we have now the drama, the unfolding, all of that. We have the full setup. We know everything that we need to know in order for this story to just unfold before us. So let's just put into the chat, what are some of the pieces that we heard there? Okay, um, so Phyllis, I think you're asking, oh, they, they, they just, Julie, I'm having a hard time with them. They disappear so fast. The, um, I'm happy okay. to help so you Phyllis, I, read them out. Yeah, um, I, well, so I think I saw there a question from Phyllis that you're asking, is this the, uh, the, oh, now they're gone completely. Hold on. Okay. Um, do, are we have, do we have here the, the replay of, um, of King Saul and the King of Amalek? So, so let's just start by saying we've met Haman and we are specifically to told that Haman is an Agagite. And we know from our broader study of Tanakh that King Agag um, is a king who uh, King Saul spares. This is why he loses his throne, because we have this instruction that we read. If you participated in um, synagogue in one way or another this past week, we marked Parashat Zahor when we read the instruction that uh, Amalek, it would seem in the Torah's appraisal, is a, is a an indicator of evil incarnate. And uh, the, the way that, we're, that we meet them in the Torah is that this is a group of people who attack the Jews from behind. And uh, what our scholars say is that it was in the back that the, the elderly and the children would, um, would be. If you think about a large group of people, multi-generational walking through a desert, you're gonna have the most vulnerable in the back and they attack from the back. And this type of attacking the weak and the victim becomes a symbol of evil incarnate. And as a result, we get an instruction in the Torah that we as Jews, unlike other enemies that, um, that we need to just avoid, or maybe that we are not allowed to marry, Amalek, we have to wipe out their memory. Um, 
uh, fast forward in Jewish history, uh, it would seem that King Saul knows this instruction. And so he goes to war against Amalek. He kills everybody, but he captures the king and he does not, he elects not to kill him. And this uh, loses him his crown. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read out some of these themes. So we have this theme. So more parties, we see uh, that this is an opportunity to stand up for one's convictions. Aviva, I assume you mean that Mordechai is beginning to embody for us this idea of this image of a proud Jew who keeps his identity in the face of pressures to uh, assimilate. So Phyllis, thank you that, that Mordechai is a Benjaminite, just like Saul was. Um, so we get a sense of the otherness of the Jews. You know, there's a joke that, um, that, that's told sometimes that all Jewish holidays can basically be summed up as they tried to kill us, they didn't, let's eat, right? And so that's sort of a ridiculous oversimplification. And yet we, that's, that's the essence of, of what the Megillah is about. The whimsy with which in one stroke of a pen, Hashverosh is convinced to take off his ring, which holds his authority, and allow the destruction of the Jews. It is both part of the farcical nature of the of the book. There's this there's this reaction of what? Like that that's ridiculous. If we watched this unfold on a on a movie screen in front of us, we would say that's ridiculous. And yet, it's a it's a ridiculousness that to know Jewish history. It hits, it hits too close to home, right? We know this both to be an expression of whimsy that's, that's, that's reckless and that we don't want to think of human communities acting in this way. And also we know from the wisdom of our experience that, that sometimes they do. Um, so, we, so we've gotten that uh, through the Megillah. Um, we have the tensions around uh, maintaining cultural identity and the pressures for assimilation, which Esther is going to embody. So, you know, we, we know we meet her both as Esther and as a Hadassah, that she has a Hebrew name, but that she goes by Esther. And we're going to see in a moment, we're going to read a little bit of her transformation. We know that she initially hides her identity, um, even though she has Mordechai sort of on her shoulder and in her ear, helping her to remember who she is. Her initial instinct is towards assimilation and in her process of finding her voice, what she does is out herself as a member of this minority population. Question, um, as, is Mimukan also Haman? I heard that somewhere. So uh, not, it, it, it's, it's possible that, the, the, that that connection is made in the Midrash that I'm unfamiliar with, but no, um, the king has many named servants um, in, in the, and advisors in the, in the Megillah. And so this is, this is on the chat level. This is just another one. Okay. So, um, uh, so we have a comment here. This is, you know, it's a, it's a flimsy reason for genocide. I think that's really, that's really beautifully said. Okay. So we have met all of our characters. We, you know, of course, we could go so much more in depth into the relationship between Mordechai and Esther. We could go so much more in depth into who is this Haman and why is he this way and how is he so, why is he so sensitive that he has to resort to genocide? Um, and we, oh, we forgot to point out, of course, that Esther gets to um, become queen because she wins a beauty contest. We have so much exaggeration. I don't, I don't know if you caught it, but she, um, she soaks for a year in various spices in order to prepare herself. And then, of course, really important feminist themes about how disposable, you know, there's no doubt there's just hundreds of women here who they are doing this entire process and they're going to then become wardens of the state, so to speak, never to leave the harem of those who have uh, spent one night with the king again. Of course, her fate is, um, she is, she is uh, lucky. Uh, yes, Richard, it, it would seem that, 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 that King Saul is just showing respect for a fellow king. Um, good. Oh, thank you, um, uh, Rabbi Fire, for putting this source for us, that, um, that, that the Gemara is, is the source that links them, um, Memuchan and, and Haman. Okay, so 
We said that the Megillah is the story of Nafsuhu, the story of the, re the reversal of fate, of turning things on its head in order to um, open up and watch uh, the, the deep meaning unfold. So I'd like us to actually look at that verse. Um, I'm going to read one more comment before I stop to share. So Deborah is saying, another element of satire, Ahasuerus takes all the virgins of the kingdom. The audition is that they spend the night with him and then they become concubines. What does this do to the Persian gene pool? That's interesting. I'm not sure I, I'm not sure exactly I understand what you mean by that. We're going to leave that as a rhetorical question about the per Persian gene pool. But yes, really good um, summation of, of what happens there for the, for the women. So I just want us to see this Nafoku verse. Uh, it comes at the end of the Megillah. I'm going to jump. Um, so the way that this reversal happens, uh, so we, we've had a great deal of drama. We're going to go back and we're going we're gonna to watch Esther's uh, transformation. I just want to do it in this context of Um, uh, And this verse, we're, we're coming here at the end of uh, a war. And so on the 13th day of the 12th month, that is the month of Adar, when the king's command and decree and decree were to be executed, the very day on which the enemies of the Jews had expected to get them in their power, the opposite happened. And the Jews got their enemies in their power. Throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus, the Jews mustered in their cities to attack those who sought their hurt, and no one could withstand them for the fear of them had fallen upon all of the peoples. And I'm gonna to jump to the Hebrew for a moment, that it was exactly on this day, um, uh, and it was this great reversal that happened. So we said that the Megillah is the story of Hester Panim. This is a world in which God, God's self is hidden. And it's also a world in which everything that you expected gets turned on its head. And so this, this theme of reversals, we see it happen in a number of our characters. So of course, Mordechai, who was, who was um, low, uh, may, maybe we'll see this on the inside. Um, Mordechai, when he hears about Haman's decree that we read from chapter three, we meet him uh, clothed in sackcloth and ashes, uh, sitting outside of the palace gate. So he is brought low and he eventually is raised up to the highest heights to be second to the king. And he gets paraded around, um, paraded around on uh, the king's horse. Where's our chapter four? Okay. Um, and, uh, we're going to read in a moment about Esther's reversal from the inside and Haman, who thought that he was going to, you know, be, be all that, um, ends up hanged on the very, uh, gallows that he had prepared for, um, uh, for the Jews, for Mordechai. So we have all of these reversals that happen, but the reversal that matters to me is the one that takes place within Esther. So, um, uh, we have whispers of God and God's presence in the, in the book. And I want you, when you, if you hear the Megillah on Purim, I want you to notice that, you know, we play with our melodies a little bit. So sometimes when we mention the exile, we drop in to the melody that we use to chant the, the, um, uh, to chant Lamentations, which documents the exile. Um, and when we mention the king, when we want to see just hints of God, when we start to get suspicious of God working behind the scenes, we drop into the melodies that we use for on the high holidays. Rosh Hashanah is the holiday of enthronement of the king. And so we, we drop into the melodies of Rosh Hashanah in chapter six when we say that, that the melech can't sleep. And this, this moment of the melech not being able to sleep, this is when the nafuchu starts to happen. We're not gonna look at it on the inside uh, tonight because we're, we're running low on time today for you. For me, it's nice. I want to look at Esther's. When Mordechai learned all that had happened, Mordechai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. He went through the city crying out loud and bitterly until he came in front of the palace gate, for one could not enter the palace gate wearing sackcloth. 
Also in every province that the king's command and decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and everyone lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's maidens and eunuchs came and informed her, the queen was greatly agitated. She sent clothing for Mordecai to wear so that he might take off his sackcloth. How inappropriate for the, uh, for the uncle of the queen to be dressed so poorly, but he refused. Thereupon Esther summoned Hatta, one of the eunuchs, whom the king had appointed to serve her and sent him to Mordechai to learn the why and the wherefore of it all. Hatzach went out to Mordechai in the city square in front of the palace gate and Mordechai told him all that had happened to him and about the money that Haman had offered to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him the written text of the law that had been proclaimed in Shushan for their destruction. He bade him show it to Esther and inform her and charge her to go to the king and to appeal to him to plead with him for her people. When Hatzach came and delivered Mordechai's message to Esther, Esther told Hatzach to take back to Mordechai the following reply. All the king's courtiers and the people of the king's provinces know that if any person, man or woman, enters the king's presence in the inner court without having been summoned, there is but one law for him, that he be put to death. Only if the king extends the golden scepter to him may he live. Now I have not been summoned to visit the king for these last 30 days. So here she is still a beauty queen who has not, uh, is not yet taking charge of her fate. She's um, for the most part in hiding still. She wants her uncle to put on clothes. Only if, when Mordechai was told what Esther had said, Mordechai had this message delivered to Esther. Do not imagine that you of all of the Jews will escape with your life by being in the king's palace. On the contrary, if you keep silent in this crisis, Relief and deliverance will come to the Jews from another quarter, while you and your father's house will perish. And who knows, perhaps you have attained to the royal position for just such a crisis. Then Esther sent back this answer to Mordechai. Go assemble all the Jews who live in Shushan and fast in my behalf. Do not eat or drink for these three days or nights, night or day, and I and my maidens will observe the same fast. Then I shall go to the king, though it is contrary to the law, and if I am to perish, I shall perish. So Mordechai went about the city and did just as Esther had commanded him. So what really interests me here is this reversal that happens inside of the heart of our heroine. When she, a moment before, had been uh, someone whose instinct was to get Mordechai to take off his signs of mourning and, um, and uh, behave in a way that was more appropriate to the conduct of the palace. And then what we have in Mordechai's words are hints of, um, of a God working behind the scenes, that deliverance will come from another source. And then this invitation, this prompting that says, who knows if it's not for just this moment that you are here. And this prodding, it becomes the invitation of the Megillah. We have here the people facing genocide, facing certain death, a situation that is all too familiar to the Jewish people. And we have a woman who in one moment is powerless, is disempowered, is hoping for the best, is hoping it all work itself out, or at least that she'll sneak by because here she herself is uh, protected inside of the palace. And then, an understanding that perhaps she is in just the right place at just the right time. And by virtue of that fact, she becomes obligated to act. And this idea of a divinity that's working behind the scenes, it offers us a very, very different way of being in the world. You know, we said that we are the people of the book, we are the people of rules, uh, mitzvot are instructions that tell us how to behave. And really, if we study the halachic tradition, what we find is that Judaism gives us very detailed instructions. Take each step of your life in just this way. And, and, and here, the Megillah offers us a very interesting counterpoint. It uh, caricatures this writing of edicts. And instead, it says, no, the world unfolds in such a way where the divine is hidden. 
And the way that we can live our purpose is simply by being fully alive and present, meeting the moment as it arises. And that if I find myself in a place facing need, the fact that I can see that need means I must respond to it. That I am the person who can see it. And if I ignore it, I, it will not be seen and I won't be fulfilling my purpose. To allow God to be hidden in this way, causing our own empowerment, it, it, um, it makes for a very different way of being in the world and maybe a way that's, um, that's more resonant with the world as we experience it ourselves. And also it's one that puts us and our actions really at the center. We're not passive. It is not that the world goes on turning regardless of what we do. Rather, we become the extension. If God's face is hidden and God's hands are hidden, then we have no choice but to say that the only hands that God has to do work in the world are our hands. We, the responsibility comes to fall on us. And that is, that's a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing for us to say, no, I am here in this moment in my life with a reason I need to take action to make the world better. So I think I was a, even a little bit more delicate at the beginning than I intended to say that, you know, I, I know for me, I only survived 2020 by getting my news from comedy, right? I just had to laugh at the news. There was no way to metabolize the news without laughing at it, right? And so here too, this the Megillah offers us a way to look at really very, very difficult themes that are still with us today. The work of Me Too and feminism, the work of systemic racism, the instinct towards genocide, the instinct towards a polarization of thinking and a black and white way of looking at the world that leads to violence. These are all themes that are still with us. And then it says, there is no savior here but you, so get to work. So it's a book that I think is profoundly resonant to, um, to this particular moment. Um, I want to uh, take, I want to close with just your questions and comments. So I want to leave you with the thought that um, I hope that you dive into Purim as the holiday, as the holiday comes upon us um, on this Thursday and Friday. You know, um, in Jerusalem, this is what we call a Purim Mishulash. It's a, it's a, you know, actually the year that Julie and I met, we also, we had a Purim Mishulash. It's just this like never ending craziness of Purim. Um, and it's an opportunity to let the world, turn the world on its head so that we can find meaning in that reversal. Turn it over so that it can come alive and open up for us. And so hopefully, you know, coming off of this uh, crazy world that we are now finding ourselves in, hopefully Purim can be the holiday that we need to let us laugh a little bit, let us hold it lightly, and hopefully have some deeper inspiration and meaning come through.